Ruby hasn't been made a particularly interesting person. She has a cool gun, and is good at fighting, and wants to be a hero, and that's about it. Your book? Does it have a name? It's about a man with two souls. I love books. I love books. Our main character, ladies and gentlemen, coming up with... So I'll actually be developing a, uh, a video essay to talk about this in particular, uh, sooner rather than later. Hello to all my queers and dears, and welcome to another one of my video essays! This time, I am excited to say I'm submitting an essay to the One Magical Scene playlist, where video essayists highlight what they love about one particular scene from Ruby. The creation of this playlist is spearheaded by RubyTuber Robin Rising for the Summer of Ruby event, and was inspired by similar essay playlists that Nando V Movies has opened up to video essayists on YouTube. My contribution will be examining the scene way back in Volume 1, that even though we didn't know it at the time, tells us everything we need to know about the entire thesis of Ruby as a show, and everything we need to know about Ruby Rose as a character. Adam Myers and Adam Switters Entertainment present I Love Books, One Magical Scene, edited by Remnant Bardock and Adam Myers. Despite being named after her, we don't know that much about Ruby Rose after the credits roll on the first episode. We know she's incredibly skilled, we know she's a nerd and a dork, we know she loves the idea of being a huntress, we know she doesn't give up easily, and we know she likes to get involved in shit going down whether people want her there or not. What we don't know is why. After a bit of a disaster of a first day at Beacon, getting left behind by Yang, shouted at by Weiss, exploding and then getting lost, Ruby is feeling quite discouraged. She's made a new friend in Jean, but a lack of known faces, insecurities over getting moved ahead two years, and Weiss's continued cutting remarks have Ruby full of doubt about whether she really belongs at Beacon. Yang tries to support her, but also tries to keep her distance. She wants Ruby to feel secure, but she also wants Ruby to have friends other than her. So when Ruby expresses intrigue at a girl in black pajamas with a little black bow reading a book over in the corner, Yang decides to try and force a conversation. Blake, however, isn't interested. Then Ruby changes the tone of their interaction. What's it about? Huh? Your book. Does it have a name? Well, it's about a man with two souls, each fighting for control over his body. Oh yeah, that's real lovely. I love books. Yang used to read me every night before bed. Stories of heroes and monsters. They're one of the reasons I want to be a huntress. <laughs> Why is that? Hoping you'll live happily ever after? Well, I'm hoping we all will. This scene lays bare the hope punk nature of Ruby. Both the character and the show. What is hope punk? Well, it's important to note that it's not being optimistic, it's not believing things will naturally work out, nor is it being naive, ignorant of the need for practical, radical solutions that will be incredibly difficult, but simply being sincerely hopeful, stubbornly, resolutely, even perhaps what seems at times to be unreasonably hopeful. Hope punk is not necessarily a belief that things will work out, so much is the belief that things can work out, despite the overwhelming knowledge of what it will take to create a just, kind world. Most of all, though, it is a dedication and a commitment to fighting apathy, nihilism, and cynicism, both in ourselves and arguably in others. The brilliance of this scene only really comes with the context of everything that comes after. First, this scene tells us, as the audience, that beyond embracing the aesthetics of familiar fairy tales, Ruby is a story that understands the weight of stories, how they can act as a refuge, like how Blake uses them, but also how they shape us, how they form us. Ruby's idea of heroism, noble as it is, is based on stories, not reality. 
As such, even before she's put in a leadership position, or given any particularly toxic advice about what it means to be a leader, she is primed to put unnecessary weight on her own shoulders. After all, the heroes and stories are often beacons of self-sacrifice themselves. The scene also tells us everything we need to know about Ruby Rose herself. Alongside highlighting her struggles with making connections and her discomfort with standing out, we receive these three lines that throughout all nine volumes of the story that the Kruppi have released to us. P.S. Greenlight Volume 10. are at the core of everything Ruby does. As a girl, I wanted to be just like those heroes in the books. As someone who fought for what was right and who protected people who couldn't protect themselves. That's very ambitious for a child. Unfortunately, the real world isn't the same as a fairy tale. Well, that's why we're here. To make it better. Ruby's personal story throughout the series is a clash between the expectation of herself to provide others with happily ever afters and the harsh reality that nothing is ever that neat and tidy. No one person can fix the whole world. And not even a genuinely noble, large team of highly skilled people can make a world completely without tragedy or pain. Even without Salem, simply living life means experiencing pain, tragedy, suffering, hate. What's so hard is we have to be willing to fight for a world with less of that, despite the fact that we can't solve every problem because any work we do to make the world kinder is still valuable. Ruby's a rather simple character as protagonists go. She wants to be a hero. She wants to make the world a better place, and she has for most of her life. She is someone who genuinely just wants to help people for no other reason than that she cares. And for this, she has been accused by some as being boring. And fine, if you personally find a character like that boring, whether it be Ruby, Sonic, Superman, that's your right. However, it is imperative not to overlook what Ruby Rose has to teach us about cultivating hope, about how to approach personal responsibility when it comes to making the world a better place, and about where the line is between naivete and idealism. Ruby as a show is the epitome of hope punk, and Ruby Rose is the main reason why. Thank you so much to everyone who watched this video. This is a bit of a shorter video, obviously, and I'm working on plenty of others that will be a little bit bigger in scope, but I really wanted to make sure to get this out to folks as part of the Summer of Ruby. Summer of Ruby was an event that was planned back before we knew Rooster Teeth was closing, when the only news we had had was that the Rooster Teeth Expo, RTX, would not be happening this year, as was initially thought, and has happened every year for many years now. We wanted to make sure that there was a chance to get Ruby fans together and really celebrate everything that Ruby is to us, and why it's so important that Ruby as a story gets to finish as the creators intended. On a personal note, Ruby is my favorite story of all time. The conversations that it has within it about violence and justice and hope and responsibility and idealism and the challenges of upholding ideals within a world that is so unfair. Well, you may have seen some of my other video essays on this channel and you'll know probably through those that those are very related to the core of my own being. That's an awkward way to phrase it, but suffice to say, Ruby means a lot to me. And Ruby being a show all about hope, even when maybe it doesn't seem rational, because it can give you the strength to make a world where it's more rational, is why I am looking forward to the future of Ruby, even as it hangs in the balance. It's hard to know where everything will go from here for this show that I love so much, but I believe in its future. It means a lot to me, and I'm really happy that I got to talk about this with you all. Huge thanks to my friend and editor Bardock. Couldn't do this without you. Thanks to everyone in my incredible Discord community, Adam plays a host. We have a bunch of Ruby fans there who really helped me think about my own feelings on the show through both agreement and disagreement. Plenty of disagreement. 
But that disagreement always allows me to think about my own feelings and my own beliefs and always go deeper into what Ruby as a show has to offer. You can check out my other essays via the links at the end of this video. And if you have the financial capacity, you can join my Patreon for either $1 or $3 a month. With the $3 tier giving you a lot more rewards. This includes the streams I did recently where I was breaking down H. Bomber Guy's Ruby video and the ways that it, at the very least, came across as a lot more disrespectful than H. Bomber Guy says it was supposed to. But the $1 tier being just as meaningful to me personally. With luck, I'll be putting out my next video essay pretty soon. I have a lot of interesting stuff in the works, and I can't wait to show it to you all. So make sure to subscribe to catch it when it comes out. I know a lot of people who watch my channel are not subscribed, and I would really appreciate if you would. I'm really trying to find ways to make this channel something that has more to offer than what I've given you so far, so I hope you'll join me on that journey. Other than that, leave a like if you liked the video, dislike it if you didn't, Give your thoughts in the comments, give me feedback, or hell, just comment some gibberish for the algorithm, and I'll see you all soon.